Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out to join us this afternoon for a series of uh, seminars. I know there are a lot of uh, workshops going on this afternoon, so I'm very grateful that you chose uh, Element Letters <coughs> series of seminars. We're going to talk about three things this afternoon. We're going to start off with uh, an insight to legal issues of fintech companies. Um, and I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Adrian Kozai. I'm the co head of Ellen and Lattel's FinTech practice. My other, other co head is Alex over here. So our FinTech practice covers the full gamut of uh, FinTech-related legal issues. Personally, I handle financial regulatory issues, so licensing, compliance, and the like. Uh, I'll be your guy. Uh, Alex looks at technology contracts. Uh, data protection, privacy. <coughs> we have Mark here that looks at uh, venture capital investments and mergers and acquisitions in general. We also have partners that uh, cover intellectual property as well as uh, litigation. But hopefully, we will not come to that. So let's start off with the first uh, seminar, an insight to legal issues within tech companies. Licensing and regulatory issues. So what are we going to talk about today? A couple of things. What I want to do, the purpose of this talk is not so much to make you an expert in, in terms of uh, uh, licensing issues, because I will be out of the job, but rather to just try to give you a, a mental framework that you can use to identify uh, circumstances where there might be an issue and where you might want to uh, get your legal counsel to advise you uh, appropriately. So we're going to talk about this framework, okay? Then I'm going to talk about uh, different uh, examples of fintech platforms. And I know that, you know, generally speaking, uh, if your technology underlying the fintech platforms are obviously different. But by and large, at least from our experience, when we uh, look at prospects as well as when we advise our clients, you have a, a, a certain, almost like a template of of different kinds of offerings in the market at this point in time. So we'll go through the examples of these fintech platforms and then we'll talk about, we'll try to apply them to activities where uh, you need to care about regulatory and licensing issues. Okay, and then we will talk a little bit about the MES regulatory sandbox. A number of you have asked about it. Uh, and, and I just want to make a point about the uh, actual territoriality provisions in our laws uh, which, which might apply to offerings outside of Singapore uh, as well. And if we have time, a number of you have asked me about uh, ICOs, initial coin offerings or initial token offerings. Uh, if you have time, I'll be very happy to talk about them in brief after this. So the framework for the analysis. So this mentally, this is I think the, the most important bit of the, uh, the session. The four things you need to remember. One, to identify the underlying product and service. So you really drill down to what you're doing, right? Are you providing loans? Are you facilitating the, the sale of, of uh, goods and services? Are you helping people to, to buy shares uh, via your online platform? So you need to identify exactly what you're trying to do fundamentally. Okay, then apply it to the regulated activity. And we'll talk about the different regulated activities that are very common for fintech companies. Once you match one and two, the prima facie position would be that you need a license. So the next thing to ask yourself is, can you rely on some kind of licensing exemption if you, if you actually want to rely on an exemption? And of course, some people don't want to rely on an exemption. They want to go to the authority and apply for a license because, uh, you know, they think that vis a the customer, it gives the customer a little bit more comfort that they're actually regulated by MAS. Fourth thing, uh, you need to think about your ongoing compliance and regulatory obligations. So what are the examples of typical fintech platforms? Okay. Equity crowdfunding. We just very briefly, basically we've got an online platform, we've got usually SMEs that corporates 
SMEs that want to raise funds. And we've got people who have some spare cash and want to invest in SMEs. So what the, what the online platform does is it matches the guys who want to raise funds, i.e. the SMEs, with the guys who want to invest in shares. P2P lending. Again, online platform, you've got guys who, who need money, who want to borrow money, usually SMEs as well. And you've got guys who, who, who are lenders, people who have built spare cash. So what your platform does is you put these two sets of borrowers and lenders together. Uh, Robo-advisors, I mean, typically they come in, in different forms, but, but by and large, you go on the platform, you give uh, the platform information about yourself, your risk appetite, uh, your investment objectives, and so on and so forth. And then the robo-advisor, based on the algorithm, will suggest uh, a portfolio of investment products for you. Uh, and, and then, of course, the next question is, is, is whether they continue to monitor and rebalance the portfolio. Money transfer, I mean, this is just a typical like remittance uh, kind of service where instead of going to the Western Union store, for example, you download an app and you put in your name uh, and there's a link to your bank account and you can put in whoever you want to transfer the money to and press send, it transfers the money. Uh, mobile payments, similar concept, but think of it in terms of paying for goods and services. So PayPal, for example, would be would fall under this kind of category. So what are the regulated activities? So I think this is quite useful to, to bear in mind. <coughs> The, this this uh, column here, products and services, right? So the moment you do one of these things, alarm bells should ring in your head and you should uh, think about whether you need a license or not. So number one, are you essentially dealing with securities? And I'll talk a little bit about what, what the scope of securities is, right? Are you doing money lending? Are you doing fund management? Are you providing some remittance service? Right? This is a payment system that you're running. Are you uh, providing a stored value facility like an e-wallet? And you know, I think you should bear in mind as well that as you'll see later, right, one, just because you do one of it doesn't mean it is just one of these things that will be triggered. Uh, as things stand, it really depends on the kind of product that you're offering. One product or one service might actually trigger a number of these uh, uh, products and services which would require different sorts of licensing uh, like different sort of licenses and different sort of uh, exemptions as well. Securities. Okay, so, so in our Securities and Futures Act, the definition of securities, right? So, what are securities? Essentially, remember debentures. So, these will, debentures would be bonds, uh, notes, uh, <coughs> some kind of structured products as well as well as shares, right? Your common shares in companies, these will be a form of securities as well. And of course, any right or option over debentures and shares would also be a form of uh, security. Now, uh, the other thing to remember is you need a collective investment scheme. So what's a collective investment scheme? That's when you have, when you take, when you take people's money, you put it in a pool of funds, you take that pool of funds to buy assets. You manage those assets, and in managing those assets, you hopefully make some kind of profit. You take the profit and you return it back to all the people who gave you money in the first place. So, sorry, yes? Will ICO fit in that unit? I talk about ICO later. Okay. Um, but, but it's a good, <coughs> interesting question as well. Um, so these, generally, if your underlying product is one of these things, you know, you should think about uh, whether you, you need a license or not. So once you determine that it's a share or venture or collective investment scheme, then you think about the regulated activities, right? And the typical regulated activities that will be triggered in the context of FinTech will be dealing with securities and fund management. So what's dealing with securities? I'll take fund management data about dealing with securities. Basically, it's, the, the definition is extremely broad. It is just uh, inducing or attempting to induce some, some person to, to 
to buy or sell securities. Essentially, that's it, right? And of course, if you deal with securities, the basic position is you need a capital market services license for dealing with securities. Once you need license, what are the ongoing compliance obligations? <coughs> These are it, right? Base capital, 50,000, 5 million. Possible group shareholder funds, 200 million. Security deposit, 100,000, so on and so forth. Now, now, I want you to apply your, so based on what I've said, dealing with securities and the like, I want you to apply your mind to equity crowdfunding platforms. Okay, just remember, what do we talk about for equity crowdfunding platforms? Basically, what you're doing as a platform operator, you are putting SMEs who are issuing shares, and you're putting them with guys who want to buy shares, right? So essentially, the platform is facilitating the purchase or acquisition of securities, which means if you operate an equity crowdfunding platform, very likely that you will be dealing with securities, and you need to get a license, and you need to consider all these ongoing uh, compliance obligations. Of course, there are certain exemptions. So, for example, for um, equity crowdfunding platforms, fintech-related uh, kind of companies, this group shareholder funds of two hundred million is generally uh, MES may waive this requirement because you must you must also understand that our Securities and Futures Act, all these regulated activities, the Act was drafted at a point in time when you know fintech wasn't wasn't really around. Right? So this is really. Uh, sort of geared towards real, really big financial institutions like broker dealers, right? Or, or yeah, keeping securities, that, that kind of entity, or, or even banks. So I think MES has been quite responsive. They know that you know equity crowdfunding platforms have been sprouting out. So they've tried to reduce uh, these these requirements. So so basically, if you if you're an equity crowdfunding platform and you only deal with accredited investors or institutional investors which are actually a form of sophisticated investors, then your base capital uh, can only, need only be 50,000. Usually they don't enforce this 200 million shareholder funds thing because you, you don't typically have a big group of shareholders. Uh, security deposit of 100,000, this is usually waived. Um, but the rest of this stuff, fit and proper requirements, this is very important. They won't waive it. Professional indemnity insurance, they usually ask me to take it out as well. AML, CFD, non-negotiable. It's money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism. Capital adequacy requirements, risk management framework. So I want to talk a little bit about fit and proper. What does that mean, right? So there are three things. One is, uh, basically, you, you need to have, the, have honesty and integrity. Number two, uh, you need the necessary experience. And number three, you can't be a bankrupt previously. So, so to date, what have we said? We said that equity crowdfunding, you probably need a license for dealing with securities. What else do you need to consider? Prospectus requirements. Why? Because what you're doing is facilitating the offer of shares uh, to, to retail investors. Right? For most crowdfunding platforms, it's retail investors that you want to, to offer shares to. So you need to make sure that you fall within uh, one of these prospectus registration exemptions. Just think about it. You know, when one offers shares to the public, it's no different from, from say, Apple offering their shares in an IPO or Singtel offering their shares in an IPO. And of course, the point of prospectus registration requirements is to make sure that, that whoever decides to buy the shares have, has enough information, right? It's, it's about prescribing relevant information in the document. So if the reality is you, you need to go to founders with MAS and the like, and if you are if you are if for every uh, fundraising you need to do this, it kills your platform. So nobody's gonna do that. So you need to make sure that you fall within one of these uh, prospectus registration exemptions. Most of the time people use this one, section two seventy two small offers, and I tell you why, right? For the first one, 275, you can only make the offer to accredited investors and you know most people just want to allow uh, all and sundry to, to enter the platform. So you want to limit, it, limit, it, limit this to sophisticated people. The bottom one, private placement, the, the key condition is you can only offer this to 50 people within any 12-month period. And of course you want your platform to be successful, right? So you don't want to be, 
hopefully you want to have more than 50 people as your well, customers. So most people you need this one. You need to make sure that uh, the corporate question, the SME that's issuing shares, does not uh, uh, raise more than five million Sing dollars in a 12-month period. Of course, there are other requirements as well, but uh, I won't. I won't go into detail. Uh, still on equity crowdfunding platforms, securities market. Right? I mean, some people will ask me if you run a, a equity crowdfunding platform, is this the same as running SGX, for example? Are you a uh, securities exchange. And thankfully, the answer is no. Uh, you're, because you are doing initial offerings through uh, your equity crowdfunding platform, it is different if you are doing secondary trading. So if, let's say, the, the company, the SME, has already issued its shares, if your platform uh, allows subsequent trading of the already issued shares, then it's different. Then you, you need to think about um, whether you are a securities market or not. Let's move on to money lending. So we're done with equity crowdfunding, money lending. So what's what's the regulation for money lending, right? It's basically just lending money from one person to another person. And, and if you do money lending, uh, the default pos position is you need a money lender's license, unless you are an excluded money lender or an exempt money lender. So let's let's. Uh, talk a little bit about excluded money lenders. So what's an excluded money lender? Basically, anyone who falls within this category. And for most people, uh, they rely on this bit. Lends money solely to corporations. And so let's think about it in the context of P2P lending platforms, right? What's P2P lending platforms? You have an online platform, borrowers, lenders, you put them together. So technically, the guys who are lending money they would be. They would need to to hold a, a license for money lending, but because they are lending money to corporations, i.e., the SMEs that are borrowers, they are considered excluded money lenders, and they don't uh, need the license. But I, you know, I, I want to say one thing here about P two P lending platforms as well. It, it's so we've talked about the money lenders license, but remember how I said you need to think about different regulated activities and how one particular service might trigger different uh, regulated activities. I think this is a good example. In, in our Securities and Futures Act, there's actually a provision that says that if somebody invites another person to lend money to a company, it will be treated as the company issuing debentures to that person. And there's a, as, there's a good reason for, for that. The good reason is this. If a company wants to raise funds, I mean, the most obvious method is, besides loans, the old, most obvious method is it issue shares, right? If, you, it's it, if it issues shares, then it needs to register a prospectus. And, it, and the people who buy the shares are protected ostensibly because of what's in the prospectus. So actually, if you're a company, you can get around this requirement by saying, I want to raise funds, but instead of, uh, instead of uh, issuing shares, I tell everyone, hey, you know, don't buy my shares, instead just lend me money. And you get the same effect, your fundraising as well. But it's, it's sort of a way to circumvent the prospectus requirements. And that, that's why I think in our Securities and Futures Act, there's that particular provision which I just mentioned that says that in this this kind of situation, in this kind of situation, it will be deemed that the company is issuing a debenture. So that sort of brings a whole level of complication into, into the situation. Because if you are issuing a debenture, then remember what I said, what's a debenture? A, a debenture is also a security, which means that you need to go back to all of this stuff. that I talked about under securities, right? Because if your loan is going to be considered a debenture, remember, I said debentures are a form of securities, which means you run the P2P lending platform, you'll be dealing with securities, you need a license, you need to think about prospectus issues as well. MAS has made this very clear, by the way, uh, in, in one of their guidelines. So P2P lending platforms, the big takeaway is you lend to corporations, you don't need a money lenders license, but you probably still need a 
capital market services license for dealing, as well as we need to care about prospectus requirements. Okay, let's, let's move on and talk about fund management. So the regulated activity of fund management, what would that be? Basically, you take money on behalf, uh, you, take some, you take money on behalf of a customer and you manage on behalf of that customer a portfolio of three things, securities, futures contracts, or you do leverage foreign exchange trading or foreign exchange trading for this person. So in the context of uh, robo-advisors, usually it's, it's securities, some form of securities that you're doing the managing uh, on behalf of the customer for, right? So the moment you, you, you for robo-advisors, the moment you manage a portfolio of securities, you need a, a license for fund management. And these are the ongoing uh, requirements that you need to fulfill. Base capital, fit and proper, we talked about that. Uh, EML, CFT, capital, and equity of the line. So MAS is actually uh, looking at streamlining some of these requirements. It's issued a proposal, a consultation on making it a little bit easier for global advisors to operate. But uh, it's still in consultation phase, so we don't know whether, uh, how it will be implemented eventually. So the other thing to note about global advisors is that you could also be um, providing financial advisory services uh, under the Financial Advisors Act. And this is the difference, right? So, so for robo-advisors, you put in your investment objectives, you put in your, your, your risk tolerance level. If the point of the uh, robo-advisor is to go through the algorithm and then spit out a series of recommendations, and, and once and the undertaking is that it will continue to monitor uh, whatever it has advised you to buy on a continuous basis, then it's likely to be fund management as a regulated activity. However, if it's just a one-time exercise, so you put in investment objectives, risk, blah, 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 the robot advisor says buy five things, and it has no uh, undertaking to continually monitor your portfolio, right? You monitor it yourself. If that's the case, then it's not fund management, but it is um, financial advisory services. So, so I think, the way I, I, read, I remember it in my mind is, is there an obligation, a continuous obligation to monitor the portfolio? Remember, just one off, financial advice, continuum obligation, fund management. Okay, so if it's a one off thing, uh, financial advice, you need a financial advisor's license, um, and the requirements are very similar to what I talked about for uh, your dealing securities or your fund management license. Okay, remittance business. This is uh, you giving money to somebody and asking that person to send money from Singapore to outside of Singapore. Right? What's the license that's required? The remittance license. What's the key licensing requirements? These are you. I want to say something about the remittance, the remittance business. Um, in the past, actually, M MES is, is, is quite progressive with, uh, with remittance because there's actually a provision in one of the notices and guidelines, the one that deals with money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism. Those guidelines say, essentially say that if you don't, do not do face-to-face -face, uh, KYC, they will not issue, so I'm paraphrasing, but essentially if you don't do face-to-face, -face, they won't issue you a license, right? And that that was the initial position. The position has since changed, but that initial position actually made it very, very difficult for fintech companies that wanted to do online remittance business because it means that it kills the business, right? I mean, for every guy that downloads your app, you actually he actually needs to go to your office, and then you have to have a guy sit in front of him and ask him questions and make sure that he's he's uh, kosher. Uh, and I know some of the the fintech companies, remittance companies, were very eager to roll out. So they actually hired people to drive to their customers' homes and do the face-to-face uh, -face KYC at their doors. 
Uh, but MES has since relaxed this position. So now you don't have to do face to face, you can do non face to face, but there are certain uh, procedures that they expect of you. Payment systems. So, so this, this might be the last system. So this one, you know, think of PayPal, right? You buy goods and services, uh, your system, through the system, whoever buys your goods and services get, can, can pay for the goods and services. <coughs> so the good thing is, as things stand for payment systems, you don't actually need a license. Right? It's just, um, MES just has certain information gathering uh, powers. But, you know, you need to be a bit, uh, uh, again, you need to consider the full gamut of what you're doing. Because if as part of your payment system, you are essentially helping someone in Singapore transfer money or pay someone in Hong Kong, then you need to think about remittance issues as well. Uh, because it's an overlap. So you're not, it's not just a payment system, you are also undertaking a remittance business. Some, some, uh, some of these uh, fintech operators offer stock value facilities. So think of your e-wallet, for example. Or even for payment systems, let's say you allow some, someone to, to give you money and you hold it as a stock value facility, and then this person, as and when the need arises, can transfer money in and out of the system or use it to pay for kids and services. This would be stock value facility, right? Again, you don't actually need a license for this um, unless you hit $30 million, uh, the threshold limit, right, in terms of the amount that's stored. As long as you know this, you don't actually need a, a approval from MES. And generally speaking, the compliance requirements are less, but uh, MES will have some information gathering powers. Um, just one, one, one last thing on, on, on payment systems and remittance. MES is said that all of that will not all of that. Some of that will change. They're issuing a, a, the consultation paper on payment systems next week. And you know how I talked about this overlap. The problem is for, for one particular offering, you have all these different kinds of regulated activities and these fall under different laws as well. So it's actually very complicated and, and sometimes com diff difficult to comply with. So MAS has actually taken that on board and they are issuing a set of, of draft laws and regulations that, that's meant to collapse all of this so that you only need one license and the specific type of activity is modular so depending on what you're offering it's one license for a certain module one license for a certain module so we'll wait to keep i think it's worth uh, um, monitoring the situation go to the website i think sometime in the middle of next week they, they might uh, release it i mean it's fintech uh, regulatory samples I, I just want to say two things about this. The, the sandbox is not uh, a way to circumvent licensing requirements. Two things you need to bear in mind about using the sandbox. One, your, your, your offering must be innovative. So for example, you know, we've been talking about equity crowdfunding for example, right? I mean, if you're going to be, if, if your offering is another equity crowdfunding platform, unless the technology is particularly special, you're probably not going to be able to use the sandbox under the current guidelines because it's not innovative. And all those guys who actually went through the licensing process would be shortchanged if they allowed you to go to use the, the sandbox. So I think MAS is quite fair when it comes to uh, imposing the, the policy requirements. Uh, the other thing to, to bear in mind is you need to actually think about all the requirements and obligations that you would have had to comply with if you applied for a license. And basically think about what you can't comply with and how you will comply with it after you leave the sandbox. So actually that's, I mean, in my view, a little bit restrictive. Um, and perhaps that's also the reason why uh, maybe there are not that many entrants into the, the, the sandbox. I think to date there's only two or three that have entered the sandbox. But I think that there have been some announcements by MAS that they might loosen up the requirements and make it easier for people uh, to use the sandbox. So I would suggest that you watch the space and, and see what happens. Okay, last thing I want to say is for actual territoriality. And you know, the, the thing to, to bear in mind is this. 
these same tech offerings are not just for Singapore, they're not just for Malaysia, they're usually global. Right? And just because you are licensed in Singapore doesn't mean that if you offer the product to, to the US or to France or whatever, that's okay. You, know? you, you still need to think about the licensing requirements in those jurisdictions. So just, just bear that in mind. Um, okay. I just want to spend about five minutes talking about ICO uh, very, very briefly. It's something that, that uh, I talk about every day, at least three times, because I keep getting uh, phone calls about it. People seem to be very interested about it. So there are a couple of things to bear in mind. Right? What's an, very briefly, what's an ICO? ICO is this. Let's say you've got business, you want to raise funds for the business, right? Typically, I mean, in the old days, what you do is share offering, you offer shares, so IPO, right? But now you don't offer shares, you offer tokens instead. And what can you do with these tokens? Typically, you can take, fundamentally, you take the tokens and you, you can use them in the business that uh, the issuer is offering. So let, let's take an example. Let's say a real life example, by the way, of a call that I had. Let's say I want to make a dating app, I right? create a dating app. I have no money, no money to pay the software guys. No money to pay myself, no, no money to pay my employees. So I do an ICO. I issue tokens. So people who buy my tokens, uh, what can they do with the tokens? They can take the tokens and, and uh, use it in my dating app. And once they, they put the tokens into my dating app, they, can, they get to go online and, and choose people to whom they want to date. Um, now, <coughs> the, from a financial regulatory perspective, the difficult thing is this, for your token, right, if it's just a pure utility token, it's probably okay. It's not okay that it is. it won't be considered a security. If it's not a security, then all the stuff that I talked about, about dealing in securities and uh, fund management and all that, you don't have to care about it, right? at least from the perspective of the ICO. But the difficulty is, uh, for some people, for, for, for some issuers, they want to make the ICO more enticing for, for, for people, right? So they don't just, just want to offer entry into the dating app. What they want to offer is, oh, maybe you get a share of profits after the first year, or oh, maybe I'll give you an interest rate, cyber or LIBOR plus how many percent. Maybe I'll give you some voting rights on, to determine how my business does. Maybe I will promise after two years, I will buy back your token if you still have it and a Greek formula so you can possibly make a profit. Now, the moment you have things like that, it becomes more and more like a security. Because remember what I said about securities, you've got shares, you've got debentures, you've got bonds. I mean, all of that, think about shares. You have voting rights, you have dividend payments. You think of debentures, what do you get? You get interest rate, you get return of the principal, um, and possibly for structured products, you get some kind of uh, return of a, a reference entity. Like, like a business. So it becomes more and more like a, a security. And the moment that, that happens, the risk that MAS will see as a security, in my opinion, will, will increase. And actually, they've, they've issued a set of guidelines, which you guys should go and check out. I think they set it up yesterday uh, that talks about different situations and different situations and how MAS will treat these different situations. So, so I think that, you know, the long short of it is, on, just on the ICO point, right? Think of it as like a Takashimaya gift voucher. Um, if, if, like, say, I, I want to give you, I want to give you a present, right? So I, I, uh, I go to Takashimaya and I buy fifty dollars worth of, of stock credit, right? I take the voucher, I give it to you. Now, what can you do with the voucher? All you can do with the voucher is go to Takashimaya and buy whatever goods and services that that they offer, right? Does Takashimaya promise you a return on your profits? No. Does Takashimaya promise you an interest rate? No, nothing. Can, does Takashimaya say that they'll buy back the, the thing from the launcher from you at a certain price? No, they don't. They just use it to buy their goods and services. And I think for an ICO, if that's the case, if it's just a utility token like that, the risk that the token itself will be considered a uh, uh, security is, is probably negligible. Okay, so that's the ICO part. But, but having said, you know, having said all of that, you still need to care about your underlying business. So, so I've talked about the example I gave was a dating app. Obviously, dating app is not like a financial security thing, so there's no problem. But for some of these guys, they do the ICO, but it feeds into a business that is actually a, a, a 
regulated business. So it could be like they feed into a business that's a remittance business, or they feed into a business that's equity crowdfunding. So you still need to care about your underlying business to see whether you need any uh, licenses. Okay, I think I've taken enough time. Uh, that's, that's it for my section. Thanks. I'll be around to answer questions after this.